On November 22nd, 1963, in downtown Dallas, Texas, shots rang out and killed President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Various government reports, including the famed Warren Report, have always countered with conspiracy theories, leaving many convinced that we will never truly know who pulled the fatal trigger or why. Both sides present compelling evidence, including distinct medical data that doctors, ballistic experts, and surgeons such as myself have spent many years analyzing and interpreting, looking for the truth. I am certainly not a historian and do not claim to be, but we are in a unique position to comment on and to discuss the assassination of the president on the 50th anniversary of his death. Joining me today is Dr. Robert McClelland, who is a world-renowned general surgeon who was indeed in Trauma Bay 1 at Parkland Memorial Hospital on that fateful day. Thank you for joining me to discuss the historic and medical importance of this event in this special video for plastic and reconstructive surgery. It's a real honor to have you with Thank us today. Thank you, Dr. Um, Glad to be here. For those who don't, who don't know, tell us what you were doing on November 22nd uh, before President Kennedy was brought to the Parkland ER. Uh, on that day, about noon, I was in the operating room at Parkland in a um, conference room showing a movie to a group of senior surgery residents about how to repair a hiatus hernia. Okay. And uh, as I was in the middle of that, I heard a little tap on the conference room door. And so I went and peeked out the door and standing there was Dr. Chuck Crenshaw, one of our senior surgery residents. And he said, Dr. Mack, would you step out here? I need to tell you something. So I went in and shut off the projector, stepped outside. And he said, they just called the emergency room from the police station downtown and said that they're bringing President Kennedy into the emergency room and they want all the surgery faculty to come down immediately. We got on the elevator there and went down to uh, the emergency room. And when we got down there and walked out into the large pit area, the about a 50 square foot, uh, I mean 50 feet on each side area, uh, in the emergency room, I saw that area was uncharacteristically jammed from with shoulder to shoulder with men wearing business suits. And that was about 12.30, right? This was about 12.30. And as we took that in, uh, that crowd spontaneously parted and made a little corridor down toward uh, the trauma rooms that were off of the pit area in the emergency room, two on each side. And sitting in a folding chair outside of trauma room one, I saw Mrs. Kennedy. So I immediately thought to myself, well, this is exactly what they said it was going to be. Right and was horrified at that thought. And then I was, after that, I was also immediately horrified by the thought that I might be by myself as a faculty member in surgery. So right. you were the first one on there? I, no, I wasn't. At that time, our faculty consisted of four people. Really? Dr. Uh, Dr. Shires, who was our chief, uh, and Dr. Perry, and Dr. Baxter, and myself. That was it for the full wow. surgical, general surgical faculty. For all of Parkland? All of Parkland, everything. And I had to literally force myself to keep walking down toward Mrs. Kennedy and walk past her and push the door open and walked into trauma room one and was horrified. What I saw there immediately was President Kennedy lying on his back, face up, his bloody head and a shot, light shining down on him. Well, after that horrific sight, I was gratified to see that Dr. Baxter and Dr. Perry had just walked into the room okay. right before I did. So what did you do? Uh, what was the first things that you did when you uh, went in to see President Kennedy? Well, I walked on into the trauma room and walked by the gurney on the left side where the president was lying. <clears throat> and Dr. Perry leaned over and handed me an Army-Navy retractor. And he said, Bob, would you go stand at the head of the gurney and lean over and we were about to make uh, an exploratory wound into the president's neck, said uh, Malcolm, told me he had, they had already begun that. And he said, we saw a little hole here, what appeared to be uh, a bullet hole, mm -hmm. about a quarter of an inch. In his trachea. Yeah. Uh, well, next to his trachea. Next trachea. It, it involved his trachea, but it didn't go right through it. It was just next to it. Okay. And the bullet hole was right where I'm pointing. Uh, and he said, we're going to explore this because we're worried about the carotid. 
Some people have said, well, they were just doing, an, doing a tracheotomy. Well, he, Dr. Carrico had already placed an endotracheal tube in him as soon as he came into the emergency room. And Dr. Carrico so was, was the pit boss. He was yeah, a second year. That's resident. right. And so he was the first one, the very first physician, to see the president on that day. And then, as I said, intubated his trachea immediately, and they attached him okay. to uh, an artificial respiration machine and brought him on into uh, trauma room one. So the main reason uh, that that incision was being made was not to place the tracheostomy, although a tracheostomy was placed and the endotracheal tube was removed, but primarily to look at the carotid and, and the major vessels in that side. So that's what they were doing, and I went to the head of the gurney and leaned over to put that retractor in the upper edge of that incision they were making. And when I got there, I said, my God, I said, have you seen the back of his head? And they said, no, we just walked in here before you did, and we haven't seen anything but this hole in his neck. And I said, well, there's a wound in the back of his head here on the right side that's at least five inches in diameter, a circular wound far in the back of his head. So show us where that was. It was back here. Okay. And I could actually look down within the skull cavity and see that the whole right uh, back half of the right cerebral hemisphere was gone. In fact, Mrs. Kennedy, Dr. Jenkins told me, the anesthesiologist, had come in carrying a portion of brain in her hand and mm -hmm. handed it to Dr. Jenkins when she came in. So the back half of the right side of his skull cavity was empty. And as I stood there, in fact, the right half of his cerebellum slowly fell out of that hole onto the gurney. So and you were, was, you were on the right hand I side? I was standing there looking at that when it fell out. What happened next? So you were doing all the ABCs of trauma right, care right. and starting the IVs and everything. I think you started in his leg and right. you gave him there some site court. people and they're doing that, of course. Right, yeah. and the nurses. Yeah. And, then, um, and then you proceeded with the resuscitation and then Dr. Clark, who's the chief of neurosurgery, came in. He came in and stood over to the right side of the gurney by the ECG monitor. Okay. And was looking at what Dr. Perry and Dr. Baxter and I were doing and watching that monitor. And so about seven or eight minutes, I would judge, into that exploration that was being done, Dr. Clark looked at the monitor and saw that it had straight line. Before that time, he had had good cardiac activity. He did? Yes. Uh, so there was no doubt that in the sense of a pure definition of death that he had not died. Right. And was not dead when he was brought into the room. There's been some confusing discussion. So he had a that. pulse and a He yeah. had a pulse, had good electrocardiographic act, and was even making agonal attempts to breathe okay. before the machine was attached to him to breathe. And so about seven or eight minutes into that exploration, Dr. Clark looked at the monitor, the ECG monitor, saw that it had straight lined, and then he immediately said to Dr. Perry, he said, Mac, you can stop now because he's gone. And that was, then we all stepped back. And that was about one o'clock, right? That was about one o'clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? That changed? After that, that room, which by that time was jammed with people of all kinds. Secret service and? Uh, well, no, not them. People wandering around in the emergency room. Okay. No official people were there that I could see. The only thing that's kind of notable in my mind, uh, in the early part of that uh, exploration that we were doing, uh, the door opened to trauma room one, and this man in uniform slipped in, you know how you kind of slide inside a door and stand against the wall? Right. Well, that's what he did, and he had a briefcase handcuffed to his arm, and someone in the room said, here's the bag man, and what that meant, here's the man who was carrying the nuclear attack codes that he constantly stayed with the president. But we didn't know at that time whether this was the first step in some sort of Russian attack. And here was a man who could activate those codes and the man who had the codes there, only they were basically out of commission. How many people were in, were in the trauma bay area and then there was like of all those? All people all over outside. Outside, but and in the trauma the bay? Trauma room one was jammed from wall to wall okay. with people, most of whom had no business being in there, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know who they all were, but they were mostly people just there in the emergency room. To my knowledge, there weren't any other Secret Service people or anything like okay. that. So it was you, Dr. Carrico, Dr. Peters, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Pepper Jenkins, who is the anesthesiology right. chief. Dr. Right. Salyer, Dr. Ken Salyer. Yeah. 
okay. who was a plastic, well, he was actually first year, I think, plastic surgery resident at that time. But well, usually after that, you know, the the um, the medical examiner takes over. What right. what happened? We all left. Dr. Perry, Dr. Baxter, and I, and and Dr. Peters all came up to the operating room and sat down out there and the co by the coffee pot near the nurses' station, and we're kind of looking at one another as if you know, my, did that just happen? Uh, you left we the really president, there. and he was yeah. yeah. And um, so we uh, were sitting there talking about this. And what happened, as I understand it, now this is not something I saw, but what happened after we left Trauma Room 1, the O'Neill Funeral Home had been uh, called to bring out a coffin for the president. Right. And they brought that coffin out, a big ornate coffin, and uh, put the president in it there in Trauma Room 1 and left that on the gurney that he had been on and then rolled it out of the room to begin to leave the hospital. And we, as we were sitting there, uh, in the operating room right after we left trauma room one, Dr. Rose, who was our forensic pathologist at that time, yeah, the medical examiner, right. came up uh, to where we were and sat down with us there by the coffee pot. And he said, well, that was an experience I just had. And so he told us what happened with him. Uh, he was sitting in his office, as I understand it, at that time was had a window looking out on this long corridor that was right next to the emergency room near the pathology area in the hospital. And uh, coming down this long corridor, as he looked out his window toward the loading dock where there was an ambulance pulled up, um, was this procession of people um, with uh, President Kennedy's coffin on the gurney. They were pushing it along and uh, leading that uh, little procession were two Secret Service men, one with a uh, Thompson submachine gun and one who was unarmed. In the normal sequence of if somebody dies in the emergency room from trauma or a gunshot wound, that they then go to the medical examiner's uh, area, yeah. Dr. Rose, and actually have an autopsy. That's right. And that's that was circumvented by the Secret yeah, that's Service. That's right. right. And so what happened, this little procession that was coming down the hall that Dr. Rose looked out his window and saw. And on one side of the gurney, on the left side again, Mrs. Kennedy was walking along. And on the other side, several of the president's friends were walking along. Um, I think that was uh, Kenny O'Donnell and Dan Powers and several others who had come down to Washington with them. And they were walking along on the other side of the gurney, about to leave the hospital and take the president's body and put it into that ambulance. <clears throat> so. Uh, Dr. Rose said with a good deal of reluctance, I got up, stepped out into the hall, and held my hand up and stopped them mm -hmm. and told them, I said, I'm required by law to let you know that any murder that's committed in this state, my, the person must undergo a, a, an autopsy uh, by a forensic pathologist. And so Dr. Rose said nobody said anything. They stopped, listened to him politely. And, but didn't say anything. And then he said the Secret Service man who was unencumbered by the machine gun walked over to him, put his hands underneath his armpits, lifted him up off the ground, and set him over against the wall. Lifted him up off Physically. the floor. And set him over against the wall and shook his finger in his face, didn't say anything, and then turned back to the gurney and they rolled on out to the hospital, to the uh, ambulance. They had no intention of leaving the president's body here. Right. And they then took him to Love Field where they, they boarded back. Air Force One where, right. where they had taken LBJ who was then... Um, Already in the plane uh, under getting the sworn in. Right, at that time on the way back to Washington, D.C.